Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to Finding Me and the ITV Networks with my two very distinguished guests from last week and that is Ben Mukwena and Mandla Salawan. And in the first in interview, the discussion around much of the Freedom Charter uh, focused on the whole question of interrogating this particular document which was or has been portrayed in, in Ben's word I think as almost as if it is a Bible and untouchable something that we cannot open we cannot interrogate but that we should just take for granted and my guests have said no the time has come where we really need to interrogate and to see and consider its relevance but we concluded on a very very dynamic point and that was raised by Mandla in raising the contention in the Freedom Charter that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And Mandela's question was, how does the victor then become entitled to an equal share in the land of the vanquished? So with that, I'd like to say again, thank you very much for being here again with me and for continuing this discussion, Ben and Mandela. Thank you for thank having us. Okay, so Mandela, you ended on a very, very dynamic point. But I'm going to give Ben a chance to come in here. Because in the book, when you raise this question of South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and as you clarified, why include those specific race terminologies and rather and not say all South Africans and then interrogate this question of who are all South Africans at a more appropriate time. Ben, in the book, Mandla writes about your experience with this particular term where he says when you were in Houston and you were interviewed by the Black Panther movement and in your interview you speak about this so can you just relate that experience and tell us what it stirred in you? <laughs> well uh, Man Manda likes that because uh, you, you, you see what, what actually happened I had gone to uh, the United Nations to speak at the United Nations and uh, it was at that time when uh, the anti-apartheid movement was growing in the mm -hmm. United States so I was invited to tour uh, Houston and uh, I was hosted by the Black Panther movement I went on a radio show at 12 at night and I said how do these Americans operate 12 at night who's uh, going to listen <laughs> who's going to listen I was surprised you know uh, the number of calls that uh, you know came in, uh, but um, what basically happened was that you know, uh, as Mother says, until I said uh, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, everything was fine. From there, it was terrible. So, did you include that part, black and white? <laughs> yes, South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And you see, I was quoting the Freedom Charter mm. and. Men now uh, that, that it's basically a black radio yes uh, in the southern states mm -hmm. you see and they responded it was terrible <laughs> I was attacked up to the end but mm -hmm. one particular caller that I can never forget said to me uh, it is people like uh, that uh, Ben Mukwena there and his leaders in the ANC who sold us out to slavery more than 500 years mm -hmm. ago. By, by saying that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. It was a terrible experience. Uh, so um, I went back to, to New York and I, I told a, a leader of ours, Neom Numzan, about this. And then he said to me, Ben, what happened? Why, why did they become hostile? I said, I told him what I said. He said, oh, man, Ben, you made a mistake. You shouldn't have said that, man. Ameri Black Americans don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear <laughs> 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 South Africa belongs to all who live in it, but he, of course he then said, no, well, it's my, it's my mistake, meaning his own mistake. Mm. I should have briefed you. I didn't brief you. So, yeah, basically that's, that's the story. Yeah, but Manta, you raised that particular comment to say that why not say it to that particular audience if it is an ethical principle, if you believe in it. In other mm. words, they were playing a particular tune.
tune, a certain narrative, a certain soundbite for a particular audience and mm. another soundbite for another audience. And that's your whole question is that if that is the case, that means it's not an ethical document mm. and it needs to be interrogated. No, absolutely, because uh, uh, my, my point is that uh, if you are going to make that statement and you believe in it, you believe it's the correct principle, mm -hmm. then you should say it wherever you are. You don't pick and choose whom you say it to. But over and above that, you must then accept that you will stand and fall by your beliefs. Mm -hmm. You don't articulate your beliefs only to the extent that they allow you to stand upright and when they uh, force you to the ground, you abandon them. Because then we're not dealing with principle, we're dealing with convenience. And then, but but if you look at that, that is the, the start, the founding charter, the founding document of the ANC. And in the seminar that I attended, where both of you spoke about, there was a comment from somebody in the audience who said that the, in this particular aspect of the Freedom Charter, much of it is actually a sellout. It is a selling of principles. It is an abandoning of the struggle. And from the moment that the ANC adopted this, the comment, of course, from the floor was that it shifted from a liberation organization to a civil rights movement. Movement. Do you feel strongly about that? Well, I, I, I want to be a little bit more nuanced than that. There are aspects of the Freedom Charter which I think we can't fault. Right. Where the Freedom Charter calls for equality of everybody, I don't think we can fault that. Where the Freedom Charter says... Uh, uh, the, the, the doors of learning and of culture shall be opened to all. As a matter of principle, I don't think we can fault that. We can debate about whether they have done that now that they are ruling the country. That's a separate debate. Yes, but the issue about saying South Africa belongs to all who live in it, uh, I have argued at the seminar that you are referring to that if one analyzes the arguments that the ANC advances in trying to justify that position. The arguments actually work in the opposite uh, manner. Uh, they don't work in the intended manner because they tend to show that, they tend to reveal the sell-out nature of the document mm. rather than uh, convince you that what was said was correct. I mean, for instance, an example I made was where, where one ANC guy says the statement meant South Africa doesn't only belong to white people, it also belongs to black people. It seems to me that in order to make that statement, you must accept that the liberation movement did not believe that South Africa belongs to black people in 1955. Mm. But now if they developed the Freedom Charter thinking that South Africa does not belong to black people, but that white ownership of South Africa is a settled matter, then of course that statement is a sellout position much worse than we imagined before. And so that's the whole position then, instead of fighting for liberation, it's about fighting for inclusion, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And you, 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 you see the position was articulated by Kenneth Kaunda in the 1980s already, uh, as I indicated at the seminar, that the ANC is not a liberation organization, it is a civil rights movement. Now, it I, I've never shared that view. I didn't agree with Kaunda when he said that. Mm. But uh, what I am saying is that if people give away the land uh, in the way that it has been given away in South Africa, then it is easy to understand why other people would say you are not a liberation organization, you are a civil rights movement. It's easy to understand that. And I think when you write much on the economic aspect of the Freedom Charter from, from what I've read so far in the book, and you speak about basically the people shall share in the country's wealth, and the other aspects where you speak about also about the economy and how you understand it. Now, the people shall share in the country's wealth. Qu the question that you raised about managing the wealth, um, you know, considering after liberation and how you view this, what do you find, what do you critique about this particular aspect of this particular term in, in the Freedom Charter? That the people shall share in the country. Yeah, how do you understand this and how do you feel it's reflected in the Charter? Yeah, well, uh, basically what, what, what it is saying is uh, uh, that, for instance, uh, the mineral wealth beneath the soil, yeah. you know, the monopoly industries and the banks shall be transferred to the ownership of the people. So what, what, 
what, what that has been understood, and I think that's what it means, is that these things are going to be nationalized. Yes. Right? Uh, uh, but as a, a matter of fact, they haven't been nationalized. You know, uh, and, and I, I am not me insisting on nationalization. Mm -hmm. But you, you <coughs> see, the problem is that the Freedom Charter is the Bible of the ANC. Now, uh, so when, when Julius Malema then says, no, but you guys are not living up to the Freedom Charter, mm. and then they chase him away, he says, no, 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 you must nationalize the banks. Mm. Uh, you must nationalize the monopoly industry and so on and so forth. All that Malema is saying is, live up to your document, you know. Mm. Uh, so so those, those are some of the things that I, 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 I am raising in, 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 in the document. I, but, but of course, uh, I also point out that uh, some aspects uh, of, of the things that are being proposed there, uh, you, you cannot, you cannot uh, apply them if you are committed to a capitalist yes. society. Mm. You see, uh, you, you don't call for the nationalization of the banks, uh, but you are not co talking about transforming the society fundamentally. Mm because nationalization has always been associated with the process t towards the construction of socialism. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not going to do that, I will question you and I'll say to you, but why are you nationalizing the banks? What for? Mm -hmm. Because you are committed to a capitalist society. Mm -hmm. But if you say to me, I am nationalizing the banks, I am nationalizing the land, I'm nationalizing the monopoly industries or the mines, as part of a process for socialist construction, and then it begins to make sense to me. But just to call for nationalization uh, in a vacuum, I mean, that I have a problem with. So, <clears throat> so basically the debate is very fractured. They haven't conclusively put together all the evidences and all their arguments as to what should be and what should not be unfolding in South Africa's economy. No, in fact, my, my attitude is that the ANC of today has become uh, a political amoeba. Mm. You, you, you can't. You That's can't. a beautiful description. <laughs> you, 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 you can't see what kind of an animal is this. Oh. Where is the head? Where is the tail? You know, it is. You don't know what actually they stand for. Mm. You know, uh, as 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 we point out today, uh, when it suits uh, the ANC, uh, uh, it, it is the custodian of the Freedom Chat. When it doesn't, and then no, they are the custodians of the National Development Plan. People end up confused as to, by the way, what is the guiding document of the, of the ANC? Is it the National Development Plan? Is it the Freedom Charter? Is it ASKISA? Or what is the other new growth plan? Yeah. There are so many things. Yeah. So, uh, you forgot, did you mention yeah. the RDP? Uh, the yeah. RDP. Yeah. Yeah. Which you, was abandoned, of course. You, you, you end up not uh, actually knowing which uh, document is guiding this organization, or, or even where is this organization actually heading to? Okay, but we have to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to race this further. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the final segment of Finding Me in the ITV Networks, the second interview with my guests, Mandla Salawane and Ben Mukwena. Now, before we went on to the break, um, Mandla, Ben was speaking about the ANC as this political amoeba with no direction as to what its economic policy actually is. The Freedom Charter, of course, speaks of a, almost a Marxist capital, I mean, a socialist uh, no, a kind of a policy, etc. The RDB was supposed to enhance that vision. It was very quickly abandoned during Mbeki's tenure. I went to very capitalist, neo-capitalist kind of economic policy. And as a result, we find that we are now all over the place. But my question to you is that in spite of this call 
or let's say for example, uh, Ben you have articulated it, but I just want to thrash it out a little further, that people are resistant to this call for nationalization because they say there's so much corruption in this government that if we nationalize, we're going to drive this country to its absolute death. At the moment it's being milked and milked and we get all sorts of justifications for this. I mean, the jokes that were on Twitter about the fire pool, still, it's like phenomenal, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, how do we then understand actually utilizing this wealth, as, as the Freedom Charter says, Ben, and that, that the mineral resources beneath belongs to the people, but those who control the power, the political power to make sure that it goes to the people are the ones who are actually siphoning it off or stealing it for themselves. It's like this big pot, you know, everybody has this, and everybody's trying to feast as much as they can. How then do we reconcile this to that? Yes, the liberation movement will give you your resources. That's the theory, but the practice in reality is we see this absolute corruption. Well, in in, in, in my view, and I think I've often argued that uh, the political arrangements in any country are as good as they are observed. Uh, to just look at the arrangements on paper, uh, they, they might look very good on paper. Now, how do you get them to be as good as they are observed? It seems to me you, you do that by creating um, a civil society that is politically conscious. And I think part of the setback in South Africa is that come 1994, everybody thought it's time to relax we have got what we have been struggling for all these years. The vigilance that was there before disappeared. Now, interestingly enough, I think that uh, the icon of the liberation struggle in South Africa, Nelson Mandela, play, played a very important role in that sort of thing because I can't forget the way in which he used to say, you've been struggling for democracy, mm. you've got a democratic government, now relax, what, what, what do you need watchdogs for? You don't need watchdogs, you've got what you've been asking for all these years. But I think that was the big mistake that South Africa made, thinking that we've got what we wanted, we can now relax. I actually think once you get freedom, then you need to be even more vigilant than you were in order to make sure that you don't lose the gains that you have mm -hmm. uh, uh, achieved. So I think we need to bring back civil, active civil society into the political arena in South Africa. And, and not demobilized. But I think them. Professor Ramosi would even question and he says, that, well, have, we uh, have we actually attained freedom? We've attained liberation, but freedom is perhaps still uh, a principle or a value that we should be striving for because there is political freedom, but economic freedom is far from uh, you know, uh, being touched on or being uh, experienced by the vast majority of South Africans. Now, I want to come here to a very interesting aspect um, in the book where you write um, a comment or you mention a comment by Fanon, where Fanon says that if so, comrades, let us not pay tribute to Europe by creating states and institutions which draw their inspiration from her. Humanity is waiting for something from us other than such an imitation. And I think that for me is key. It's power, it's the whole decolonial dialogue. Rather than imitating or just expanding the existing narrative, that we should come with our own narrative, something beautiful, something challenging, so that when we present it, the old narrative looks, you know, hypocritical, it mm -hmm. looks dogmatic and that people are enticed by your new narrative. Mm -hmm. And you write this when you comment about bringing this whole question of race into the Freedom Charter. Mm -hmm. What do you think we can offer as an alternate narrative? Well, <laughs> you see, I have always found it very strange that uh, the Congress movement has taken race for granted in the way that they have taken it for granted because one of their own members in the person of Robert Sobuwe mm -hmm. made a huge <coughs> issue about this whole thing about race. So it's not as if there was no voice 
uh, opposed to this notion even within their ranks. Because you see, Sobuwe argued that in so far as human beings are concerned, the word race is inapplicable yes. because we all belong to one race, mm -hmm. the human race. And I think we should find space to bring back uh, views such as those in order to take the struggle forward to its logical conclusion. And I think Sobuwe made a very important point too because his argument was multiracialism is racism multiplied. Yes, I agree. So uh, by creating a racial consciousness, are we not negating the very objectives that we have struggled for? Yeah. My submission is that we are. Of course, and certainly I would agree with that. Mm. And seeing that we're coming towards the end part of this discussion, Ben, I'd like to get your comment about the housing, because you write it, uh, a specific part or chapter, you relate to the question on housing, that everyone is entitled to housing, and we consider the landless movements in South Africa, the shack dwellers, uh, you know, the shack dwellers movements, if you look at what's happening in terms of the resettlements, it's almost as if people are reliving this forced removal, you know, of what was happening in apartheid, it's not happening again. I mean, in the Sunday papers, there was this discussion of all those who, the shack dwellers who were moved by sand rail in Cape Town today, I mean, the situation is still as bad and as pitiful as it was. So if you look at what is happening in practice in South Africa and what the Freedom Charter says, what are your observations? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Freedom Charter says there shall be housing, security and comfort. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you can ask the people who are staying in the RTP houses whether they'll say they are comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I'm sure in your house there is a big wall there because there's no security. Yes. You have to say people are moving into gated communities. We yes. have to create yes. security uh, for ourselves. Mm. I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, but but what what hurts me about the question of of housing? I mean, if you look at uh, monies that are being wasted in mm. South Africa, you know, it is it is said that uh, uh, about 400 billion rand has been wasted uh, in the government since uh, uh, 1994 mm -hmm. in the form of, uh, uh, what do they call it? Abuse and uh, corruption. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, corruption, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, this expenditure, yes. illegal expenditure, mm -hmm. 400 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, if that money had been used properly, how many houses could you afford? We wouldn't have be having all these problems. You know, but, you but know, you know during the rainy seasons, yes. during rainy seasons, mm. it's terrible what we see uh, in, in, in the shacks. People, uh, water comes straight into the houses of people. You know, they lose mm. everything because of rain. And we have got 400 billion that is being wasted in government. So, but then where are these voices? Because, I mean, at each election, year in and year out, the ANC is still getting a, a huge percentage in terms of the voters. So, Mandla, does that come to your point where people have actually relaxed? Or are people afraid to question themselves because now we're questioning a black government and it's no longer a white government? So it, it's about looking at ourselves in the mirror. What is it? Partly it is, but there's another dynamic which I think we should factor in. Uh, wh whereas it's true that the ANC receives what seems to be an increased majority with every election, except of course the last, the last election. Way, yes, yes. Uh, but the reality of the situation is that the, 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 the majority they receive is on a reduced base yeah. because what we are finding is that more and more people are voting with their feet instead of participating in the ballot they don't go to the ballot yeah. at all the protest now part of the problem is that people are disillusioned they are asking themselves vote what for what yeah. difference has it made in 21 years now uh, 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 I think one wants to factor that in, in saying that uh, uh, people are increasing their support of the ANC. I don't think they are. Okay. Yeah. But we're coming to the end. So, Ben, I want to take a parting comment from you because I have one last question for Mandla. So what would you like to say? Uh, my, my parting comment is just an emphasis of the fact that the Freedom Charter a very important document that has played a very important role in the mobilization of people. Mm. Uh, however, it is a reflection of ideas of people who lived at a particular point in time. And times have changed and that the Freedom Charter has to be relooked into and that it must be put out in the public for debate. 
Thank you. Now, Amanda, your last comment, because I didn't get to talk at all about your book without fear or favor, mm -hmm. political essays, and your opening chapter here is on uh, Biko. Is Biko and the consciousness that he um, created something that has stimulated you and has then you know, challenged you to think and look more deeply in what the Freedom Charter says? It is. is it something that has informed your debate and what is your parting comment about Biko and about the situation in South Africa? Yeah, indeed. In, in, in fact, I think a, a, a good way of answering your question would be to refer you to uh, a, a chapter I wrote in another book, uh, which we produced in commemorating the 30th anniversary of Steve's death. Mm -hmm. Now, what I do in that chapter is I, 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 I say, basically, this is Manza Selewane before he met Bigo. Now look at him. This is what he looked like before he met Bigo. And then this is the Manza Selewane that uh, you see now uh, after he fell under Bigo's influence. Indeed, Bigo was uh, a, a, a huge influence uh, on uh, my, my thinking uh, because uh, politically I was conceived, born and bred within the philosophy that he espoused and mm -hmm. it continues to uh, influence my way of thinking in many many ways in many many respects and do you think Biko is alive in south african society i think uh, he is very much alive and i i actually find it very interesting that there was uh, a period when uh, everybody was saying uh, black consciousness is a thing of the past mm -hmm. but more and more i find these days people saying let us rethink this whole thing uh, shouldn't we ask the questions that bigo would have asked if he were alive today i i find that more and more that space is being opened up once again okay. so he is still very much alive and as a parting comment well, as a parting comment, um, in, in, in introducing myself, one of the things I said was that I would like to be seen first and foremost as a researcher. And my parting comment is that think, think, and think for yourself. Mm. That would be my parting comment. So thank you very much to both of you. And I think that actually espouses Beaker's philosophy where he spoke about freeing the mind from oppression because it is not about only about the body or about political enslavement but it is about mental enslavement as well. So till we meet again for Yamanila wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.